You are listening to a Clark's World Magazine podcast with your host and narrator, Kate Baker. Greetings, Clark's World citizens. I hope this podcast finds you extraordinarily well. This is our third story for the month of March 2020, issue 174. I want to thank you for your ongoing support of the magazine. I hope this podcast is finding you, like I said, well, all things considered. I also want to thank you for your ongoing support, whether it's just listening, whether you tell a friend, whether you spread the word on Twitter or Facebook or any social media, or whether you support the magazine financially. We can't do this without you, and every little bit helps. If you can reach into that wallet, pull out a dollar or more a month, please consider going to patreon.com forward slash Clark's World, where you can see how you can become a part of this magazine each and every month. So our story is titled The Orbiting Guan Airi and is by Wang Zhen Chen, translated by Carmen Yiding Yan. Wang Zhen Chen, a science fiction writer and undergraduate at Sus Tech, is known for telling realistic stories in a humorous style. His stories Minesweeper and Whose Funeral, published in Science Fiction World, were respectively selected as the sci-fi stories of the year for 2018 and 2019. He won the Fifth Morning Store Awards for Best Short Story for The Orbiting Guan Airi. So, my dear listener, I hope you can sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story. Old Lou, what do you say we keep a bird here in the space station? I turned my head and asked, setting down my tablet. Old Lu's full name was Lu Jixian. He was three years older than me, the ranking officer in this humble little space station, commanding exactly one subordinate, one of the top mechanical grapple operators in orbit. Lu Zhang, that's me. Hearing the name Jixian, you'll likely picture some fresh-faced pretty boy with rosy lips and perfect teeth, but no such luck he was an old-school Beijing bloke. You couldn't call him beefy, quite, but he didn't leave you room for daydreams. Fortunately, though, old Lu had a lively mind. You rarely got bored talking to him. He chatted about Beijing with me all the time. The fermented mung bean milk of Tian Tianku, the chitterling stew of Ping Anli, the birds of the summer palace, the fish of the goldfish pool. He liked to say that outer space gave him too much of a stuffy feeling, so he needed to air out his memories of his homeland on the regular to do a good job at work. Under his subtle influence, I developed a bit of a hankering for the Beijing life, too. Keeping a bird? What's a layabout with any practical know-how like you doing thinking about that, he asked. See for yourself, I drawled, and tossed the tablet to him. The tablet screen displayed a short story titled Feathered Friend by Arthur C. Clarke. The story was straightforward. A crew member on the space station was secretly keeping a canary, and a minor breach of regulations. But no one could have guessed that an accident would send the space station's oxygen levels plummeting, while the alarm system happened to break down at the same time. In this dangerous situation, the canary reacted first and passed out, alerting the crew and ultimately saving all their lives. I fully trusted the air circulation system in the space station, and I'd never properly tried to care for a pet before, but I wouldn't mind adding an adorable little backup to the space station, especially when it wouldn't cost us much of anything. Old Lu soon finished reading the story. He was quiet for a moment, chin in hand, then said, Wouldn't work. How would you know if you've never done it before? Simple. And space birds can't eliminate waste. They're not like humans. They don't have separate urethra and anuses, just a cloaca where urine and feces come out together. You wouldn't want questionable white fluids floating everywhere in the space station, would you? Ugh. My stomach turned when I considered it. More importantly, birds can't voluntarily control their waste elimination. It's fine on Earth where gravity helps out, makes the waste drop like a bomb from plane. Whoosh! But in zero gravity environment, the bird can't eliminate waste. Little thing's going to clog to death on its own crap and piss. I had to admit he made a vivid analogy. I immediately thought of the aerial bombers newly added to our country's military. They really did need a rail launcher to properly toss out the missiles. Fine. I admit you've got a point, I shrugged. 
You really did put all of your skill points into this kind of random trivia. Ha! What Beijing bloke wouldn't know how to care for a flower, fish, and fowl, he returned. At that point, a dispatch from the Tiangong main station interrupted our conversation. He waved a tablet, indicating that I should take it. Hello, are you there, little Zheng? You guys might be getting work to do. Space Station B5H35 here, message received. Main Station, what's the situation? I answered. LIDAR detected some weird little thingies. No danger of collision with you guys, but they're not supposed to be there. You guys should take a look. Thingies? Where? They're probably military satellites launched during the Cold War. Couldn't find anything on the database. I'll send you the monitoring data. If you look out from the observation dome toward Tianke, you'll see it within plus or minus 10 degrees. I grabbed the telescope and directed my gaze toward Tianke, the wreckage of a large-scale space station. Two years ago, a meteor had struck Tianke while it was still in process of construction, snapping the main axle into three pieces. Not only was repair impossible, the collision had produced a large amount of space junk. As a result, not many people ventured into this region of space even now. It had even proven troublesome for our space station, preventing us from expanding our operations. Part of the daily routine for me and old Liu in his beat-up little space station was monitoring the movement of this wreck. But today, something really had changed with the environs of Tianke. In my field of vision, about three degrees southwest of the wreck, a formation of little bright dots had appeared. They were extremely close to us, their relative velocity near zero. Even against the glittering backdrop of the Milky Way, they were clearly visible, like silver chains floating in the void. And obviously, they, if they were moving along an orbit, they couldn't be a meteor shower. I've got visual confirmation data received. I'll try to grab one, I answered. Roger that. Thanks for your work. The Tiangong main station cut off the transmission. It might sound hard, operating a cable-controlled grapple with three axes of movement to grab a small satellite, but I'm an old hand. I aimed the microwave radar toward the flashing dots. Soon, the screen indicated that the chains of light were, in fact, 12 little CubeSat satellites arrayed in a 3 by 4 formation along the same orbital path, advancing in equally spaced ranks as if fastened together by a giant invisible net. At the same time, the computer gave me the time at which they'd be closest to us, approximately one hour later. I set myself in the operating cabin, made my adjustments, then struck up a conversation with Old Lou. I'd never seen satellites in such a tight formation. Old Lou, you've got lots of experience. Have you seen anything like this? I asked. I haven't. It kind of looks like when you send multiple satellites up on the same rocket before the payload has had a chance to disperse through orbital maneuvers. He craned his neck to take a look, then shook his head. But any launch that's gotten to this stage should be complete. This looks more like someone created this formation on purpose. But who'd be bored enough to do something like that, I told him. We have a tiny window of opportunity this time, only enough for me to fetch one back. How about you take a guess what'll be in it? Didn't you say you wanted to keep a bird up here in space? Maybe you'll pick up a canary. Old Lou ribbed me, shrugging his shoulders. <laughs> With that, I returned my attention to the observation platform. There's not much to say about the process of grappling onto a target. You just steer the grappling hook into the target's orbital path, fire off the RCS thrusters a couple of dozen times to cut down your velocity relative to the target, wait for it to bump into the hook, clamp down, and reel the cable back in. Other than three axes of movement and the zero-gravity environment, it's not fundamentally different from operating an arcade claw machine, because whichever satellite I grabbed would be followed by more satellites on the same orbital path. I decided to get the front-most satellite. To avoid a collision, I had to reel the cable in quickly, but it didn't add too much hassle to the task. Soon, we had the strange cube sat inside the hold of the space station. Is this some kind of joke? I said. The object in front of me could barely be called a satellite. The cube was a little smaller all around than even a standard 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube sat without any visible sensor components on its surface. It was assembled from six sheets of galvanized iron bolted together. 
Some of the screws hadn't been tightened properly. The nuts had gone missing without a trace. Its crudeness put the shoddiest of Soviet manufacturing to shame. But old Lou was in high spirits. Either way, let's take a look at the payload first. He unscrewed the top with practice movements and lifted it away. Unexpectedly, the moment the box was opened, a cloud of icy vapor boiled out of the container, forming a layer of frost over my goggles and skin. Startled, I backed away on instinct, only to lose my balance and start spinning in the middle of the space station. When old Lou finally grabbed and steadied me, and I'd recovered from my shock, I at last discovered the real face of the payload. Some foam, clearly used for shock absorption, and a crystal-clear ecosystem sphere steaming with cold. The water inside it had completely frozen. Through it, I could see a fish frozen inside the ice. Oh, Lou, what is the sphere? My voice shook a little. I turned toward old Lou, only to find him goggling as well. It took a while before he cleared his throat and came up to put his arm around the sphere. <clears throat> uh, scientifically speaking, this ought to be a frozen ecosystem sphere. It looks like there's a carp and some vegetation embedded in the ice. He hefted the glass sphere and added, Feels about five kilos. Sure, but I want to ask... Why would this thing end up in orbit? In this instant, possibilities swam through my mind. What kind of person would take a five-kilogram ecosystem sphere thousands of miles up into outer space, then toss it outside to drift in orbit? What would their purpose be? Dong. Old Lou gave a hard rap on my space soup, bringing me to reality. Don't wool gather, take a close look at this. I responded belatedly, picking up the ecosystem sphere and inspecting it closely. Only then did I discover that the ice in the sphere looked a lot clearer than normal ice. There was hardly any distortion. I could even clearly see the patterns on the carp. It looks like the kind of crystal structure produced by flash freezing. Old Lou chipped off a bit of ice and examined it under the microscope. After a while, he suddenly remarked, Lil Zhang. We can't keep a bird, but do you want to keep a fish? Keep a fish? I looked at the sphere of ice in old Lou's hand, which showed no signs of thawing, and asked dubiously, This fish? It's been frozen into a lump. How are we supposed to keep it? <laughs> Heave little knowledge. If my guess is correct, before this ecosystem sphere was tossed into space, it was first flash frozen with liquid nitrogen. With an animal as hardy as a carp, Supercooling temperatures will only freeze it on the outside, forming a hard shell, but it won't damage the circulatory system. The ice shell would even help it survive the g-forces of a rocket launch. In other words, if we toss it into the water to defrost, it'll soon be alive and kicking, guaranteed. But even if it works, we'll be in trouble if the main station finds out, I said shrugging. He chortled. <laughs> so what if they find out? We're investigating the origins of this mysterious ecosystem sphere so we have no choice but to keep evidence. If nothing else works, I can always write up an observational report on fish gill function in a zero-gravity environment and hand it to them. They can't object to scientific research. Old Lou tossed the glass sphere to me as I spoke. I caught the sphere and looked at it for a while, at the carp, as pure and glittering as something made of crystal. It felt like I was anticipating the arrival of a new friend. That persuaded me. I set the mystery of this ecosystem sphere appearance aside as my mind already began to consider what name to give this space fish. The folks in Tiangong main station were all out of ideas regarding the appearance of the ecosystem sphere in near-Earth orbit, so they didn't stop us from keeping the fish. Meanwhile, our new pal soon proved old Lu right. In a day's time, with the melting of the ice, he'd revived from his frozen condition. He hadn't fully adjusted to the zero gravity, and he looked a little frail, but his life was definitely in no danger. Raising fish in space was already a fairly mature experimental technology. That night, Old Lou designed a custom system, adding a loop to both the water and air circulation systems and running them through a small glove box, allowing for automatic water replacement and manual oxygenation. All we had to do was toss and feed, and the fish would thrive. Three hours later, this little guy had fully adjusted to the zero-gravity environment of outer space, nimbly tumbling. 
turning in six degrees of freedom. He'd sometimes even blow out a string of big bubbles surrounding himself with them, then pop them one by one with slaps of his tail, having a blast all his own. Based on that behavior, I wanted to name him Bubbles, but Old Lou refused, insisting on calling him Second Master. It was a reference to the Peach Garden Brothers from Romance of the Three Kingdoms. He was Old Lou, as in Lu Bei. The fish was Second Master Guan, as in Guan Yu, and I was Little Zhang, as in Zhang Fei, three brothers in outer space who had only one another to depend on. The fish's status in the space station had really shot up with our getting acquainted, clearly overtaking that of a mostly idle grapple operator like me. Caving to old Lou's tyranny, I had no choice but to respectfully address him as Second Master. At first, Second Master gave us a lot of scares. The first time we saw him turn over belly up and stop moving, we thought he was sick. But when we got closer, Second Master started happily swimming around again. It made sense after some thought. There was no up, down, left, or right in outer space. In the water, Second Master chose a direction to face purely at random. Every day, when we assumed our positions, Second Master was in a new orientation. The odds of taking a normal orientation were actually pretty small. You lose track of time in a space station. Amid the daily routine of dry tasks, Second Master became our closest pal. Fish couldn't speak. Sometimes this made him an even better listener for pouring your heart out to. He had no choice but to be there for you in his primitive way, to receive you, to accept what you entrusted to him. During this time, Second Master's origin continued to puzzle us. Old Lou made a thorough search of Earth's microsatellite databases and research programs, but failed to turn up any records of five-kilogram frozen ecosystem spheres being launched into outer space. Even after analyzing the ecosystem sphere structure and construction, we couldn't make heads nor tails out of its launcher's motives. Without further leads, we even started to wonder if some supernatural hand lay behind the riddle of Second Master's origin. But our lack of clues didn't last for too long. Soon, news came from the Tiangong main station. Our orbit was once again going to take us by that parade of CubeSats, and this time the window of opportunity would be long enough for me to grab two of them. I took a seat at the console. To relieve my anxiety, I asked old Lou, same as last time, what he thought we'd haul back this time around. At most, we'll end up with a second master, old Lou guessed, unimaginatively. Since the last time we'd seen these satellites, their formation had grown slightly more scattered and messier, although they were still very close together. Visual observations showed that some of these crude, galvanized iron boxes had lost their lids. Their small, scattered components could be a serious threat to our space station. For safety, I chose to take the same strategy as my first retrieval attempt, starting with the frontmost satellite to minimize disturbance to the formation. The first retrieval proceeded without a hitch, but something went wrong while I was reeling from the second satellite back in. The hold suddenly shook violently. I cursed. What happened? I yelled behind me. A micrometeoroid hit the water tank, don't worry. Auto repair activated. Old Lou answered heavily. I took a deep breath and continued to operate the grapple, carefully towing the satellite into the airtight hold. Despite the shock, the retrieval process went through without any harm done. The two sheet metal boxes looked identical to the one before. They were just as crudely constructed, with several screws missing without a trace. The earlier hit to the space station had probably come from one of those screws. Thankfully, there hadn't been a huge difference in relative velocity, and our space station had taken precautions in a region with relatively high levels of space junk, where the consequences would have been unimaginable. Old Lou picked up one of the boxes, flipped it over, and discovered that the bottom face had a round hole in it. He deftly removed the sole remaining screw in the lid, lifted it, and seeing the payload that drifted out once more descended into a state of shock. This metal box held a huge, extraordinary flashlight. The flashlight thoroughly exceeded the dimensions of your average household flashlight. It was at least three times the diameter and more than twice the length. Fortunately, it hadn't been turned on, or the effect in the hold would be nothing short of a small flash grenade exploding. Hey, old Lou? I asked. Hmm? 
What's the cheapest rates on a commercial rocket launch? For a heavy launch, seven or eight thousand yuan per kilo. For a small launch, forty or fifty thousand per kilo. Then, what kind of crazy rich person would spend that much money to send this random crap into space? Don't stress about it. The world of rich people is beyond your comprehension. Thanks. That made me feel zero percent better. You're welcome. Old Lou turned and picked up the other metal box. What do you think is in this one? He asked. Last time we picked up a fish, Second Master Guan. Maybe this time we've picked up a real Second Master Guan, he said, giving it a wrap. We thought that after two astonishing unboxings, nothing could surprise us anymore, but reality had a knack for finding ways to rock our puny minds. When we lifted aside the galvanized metal lid, the first thing to emerge was a gold-colored cap, followed by a face. It was a familiar face, the face the color of jujubes, with brows like silkworms, narrow phoenix eyes, and a long, flowing beard. Following it came the body, holding an ingot of gold, drifting slowly out. Only then could we ascertain that this time the payload wasn't Second Master, but a real actual icon of Second Master Guan, drifting in orbit 2,600 kilometers from Earth until we managed to pick it up. Old Lou, this wouldn't happen to be something you chucked out there just to mess with me, would it? I said slowly, staring at the statuette as it rotated lazily in midair. Why would you think that, at a time like this? He'd frozen for a moment before turning to look at me. He'd clearly received a considerable shock, too. Once again, I descended into thought. Who would go to that much effort to deliver an ecosystem ball, a flashlight, and a statue of Second Master Guan into orbit? Was this some kind of art project or some kind of ritual? Don't sweat it too much. Drink some water to cool down. Old Lou patted me, kicked off the wall, drifted over to the drinking water dispenser, and poured me a cup. Maybe I'd sunk too deeply into overthinking. Even the water seemed to taste strange today, faintly acidic and displeasing. As I sipped water and pondered, old Lou suddenly gave a shout, interrupting my train of thought. Stop wool gathering. Something's wrong with Second Master. He urgently pulled me over to the water tank. To be honest, Second Master didn't seem any different than usual, idle in the water, gently waving his gills. But normally, once we'd got near, he'd start swimming merrily around. Today, he didn't react at all. Is he sick? Old Lou asked. When it came to second master, even he couldn't completely keep his cool. Don't worry. Fish are hardy animals. Was he like this earlier? I felt a pang, too, and had to toss the matter of the weird taste in my mouth out of my mind. No. He was darting around just fine ten minutes ago. I didn't think he'd suddenly stop moving. Old Lou had calmed down and was beginning to analyze the situation in front of us. Is it hypoxia? I don't think so. If it's a lack of oxygen, we'd be feeling tired too. Maybe there's a problem with your water aerator? Old Lou immediately twisted the valve on the aerator. Bursts of oxygen-rich water pumped in through the pressurization unit. The system looked just fine. So the aerator wasn't the problem. I sat cross-legged in midair, considering other possibilities. The weird taste from the water earlier still lingered in my mouth. That strange, salty taste in particular was making it hard to focus. All I wanted was to rinse my mouth out. But even before I went to get water, I suddenly felt like I'd woken from a dream. The most disastrous possibility of all appeared in my mind. I hurriedly told Old Lou, It's the water. There might be a problem with the water circulation system. Old Lou tensed all over. Instead of hypoxia, what if it's nitrate poisoning? I'll go check. He suddenly gave me a long look, then silently departed. Five minutes later, the tank's water replacement system came to life. Ten minutes later, Bubbles flicked his tail, beginning to move again. Not long after that, Old Lou came back with an awkward expression. He looked at me without speaking. Go ahead. I'm mentally prepared for whatever you have to say, I said heavily. Okay. Possibly because of the overly high calcium content in the fish feed, the purification process in our water circulation system has been under additional strain this whole time. As of last night, the system had reached its limit, only to receive an additional shock from the space junk that hit the water tank earlier, which caused the system to completely overload. 
Due to all the calcium-based precipitate clogging up the filtration system and lowering its efficiency, the amines from the urine weren't fully purified away and absorbed. They flowed into the water tank, resulting in nitrate poisoning. Old Lou described the cause of this malfunction with professionalism and scientific language. Great, so I have another question. Go ahead. This is the water from the circulation system. Yes. Water shouldn't have a salty taste, right? Can you tell me where this salty taste came from, then? Do you need a drink to cool down, too? I waved the leftover water from earlier in front of him. At this point, all the water in the tank had been replaced, and Second Master was waving his gills as if he'd woken up. Faced with my soul-piercing question, Old Lou could only laugh painfully, turn away, and start poking at Second Master. Huh, I said coldly. Second Master really is your lucky carp. I'll spare you this time. I threw the water pouch aside and prepared to rinse my mouth. Wait! Old Lou suddenly called out, stopping me. What did you just say? I said I'd spare you? What? You want to drink it after all? No. The thing about Second Master. Second Master is your lucky carp. What's wrong? I asked, not understanding. I think... I figured out the riddle of Second Master's origin, Old Lou pondered for a while, then suddenly seemed to have realized something. He grabbed the tablet and started looking something up. After a while, an advertisement that could only display on the dark web appeared in front of me, resolving all our confusion. Below is an excerpt from the ad copy. The name of the company is redacted to avoid suspicion of sponsorship. Still stressing over your horoscope? Anxious about your astrological outlook? with eight internationally renowned space feng shui experts to provide manual calculations in every rocket handmade, XX Spacecraft is here to provide the highest quality, most reliable destiny alteration services. Whether astrology, I Ching, horoscopes, or tarot, we're here to help. Seize your fate by the neck. Service Description Send a Lucky Carp this service gives you the opportunity to send a lucky carp into space to improve your fortunes on an astronomical scale. To prevent the carp from getting crushed into pulp during flight, we use flash-freezing ecosystem sphere technology. This service is only 199,880 yuan. Quantities are limited, so buy now. Lucky star watching over you. This service provides a feng shui flashlight handmade by a master, to brighten your future from near-Earth orbit. This service is only 99,980 yuan. Quantities are limited, so buy now. Appeal to a higher power. This service provides an icon of your choosing. God of Fortune, Guan Yi, Yu Lao, Jesus. To direct your destiny from on high. This service is only 169,980 yuan. Quantities are limited, so buy now. Okay, I've got to say, the stars hold very different significance to different people. Fortunately, we never tried to grab one particular satellite. It exploded before the fourth crossing of our orbits. It wasn't a bomb, just a harmless red flashbang, but it shone for a full day and night in its orbit. Apparently, that one was called Star of Bethlehem, for wealthy people who wanted their kid to grow up a prophet. But at least the problem was resolved, and all three members of our space station remained alive and well. Unlike the ending of Feathered Friend, we didn't report the whole thing to the higher-ups, just the origin of the weird satellites. That's why next time you go vacationing in space, you won't see a fishy friend in every space station. After all, I still want to be able to show my face around these parts, without providing ammo for others to take the piss out of me. Also, when you're studying the geography of space, if alongside the von Karman orbit and the Tsiolkovsky orbit and the and the Qian Jusen orbit, you see a certain second master Guan orbit. Please don't wonder at it. Trust the textbook. It's to commemorate two spacefarers who made celebrated contributions to humanity's exploration of outer space. Old Lu and Lil Zhang. This story has been 
translated and published in partnership with Storycom. What are your thoughts on the story? You can leave us a comment or a question at the Clark's World Magazine website itself, or you can go to the About Us page where all of our contact information is listed. We have a bunch of stories left for you for the month of March 2021. So I do hope you can come back and listen, should you so choose. And until then, I bid you a very fond and warm and hopefully very, very temporary farewell. <laughs>